Well, welcome, welcome, or welcome back, I guess I should say. And um, I'm Ted Peterson. I'm a professor of computer science at the University of Minnesota Duluth. And today is Friday, April 29th, uh, 2016. And I'm here to continue uh, the discussion of the development of computing that we started in the previous video. And you may recall that we worked our way up to um, through just through World War II and into the very early days of the commercial computing industry. Um, and what we see at that point, when we look in, in the early 1950s, um, uh, what the dynamic that we see there is that um, IBM and UNIVAC are uh, kind of going toe to toe, trying to establish a, a certain dominance in the marketplace, um, and and we're going to kind of pick up the discussion there and then move forward. Um, one thing we'll notice as we as we do that, I think, is that um, to some extent the the nature of the conversation changes from talking about particular personalities um, and individuals to entire organizations, and and part of the reason for that is that a big reason, a big part of the reason for that actually is that. Um, prior to, let's say, 1950, uh, electronic computers were essentially one-off individual projects uh, like the ENIAC that, you know, the ENIAC has famous name recognition more so than Mockley and Eckert, but very much a product of those two people, their minds and their work and so forth. As, as the computing industry and computing grew more complex, uh, entire organizations are involved, and so there's still going to be some kind of, you know, dominant personalities that we'll talk about, but we'll also start to hear more about individual companies and organizations like we started with your IBM and UNIVAC. Um, so um, there was a, uh, a number of other companies that were, were trying to enter the uh, mainframe computer marketplace at that time. Honeywell among them, uh, Honeywell, Minnesota-based company, uh, they got into um, uh, the uh, um, mainframe market uh, early in the uh, in about 1957, actually, a machine called the Datamatic that was a, a vacuum tube machine, which by that time was kind of uh, on the way out, and so it was kind of an immediate failure um, for them, unfortunately. Um, and uh, a GE and RCA, um, uh, big companies. Uh, at the time, they had significant infrastructure for manufacturing vacuum tubes uh, and, and, and thought about getting into computing and things like that. I mean, especially in the early 1950s, most mainframes were still vacuum tube, and all mainframes were still vacuum tube. Um, the, the transistor did not become a significant uh, tool in, in building and creating computers until somewhat later on in the 1950s. And so early in the 1950s, the transistor was still in the research and development phase and so not deployed. Remember the, 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 the transistor itself, the point contact transistor, was invented in 1947. And then there were some advancements in transistors uh, that came in the following years and, and uh, you know in, by about 1950 we had a number of different ways to create transistors and then started to see them being fabricated and used in actual devices but there was a bit of time for that. Um, it's also important to understand the nature of the business that these companies were competing for and, and what they were uh, trying to achieve was was some penetration of what's known as this um, as the unit record business and the unit record business was well established this was the point uh, the the punched card office data processing enterprise that started back in the late 1800s with Herman Hollerith and advanced and moved forward and so organizations in the 1920s and the 1930s had they had data. They had, you know, they had needs for computing and calculating and so forth. A lot of that was done with punch card machinery um, that was good at tabulating and sorting data. There were still a lot of human computers employed, people who did calculations um, manually or with the use of calculators and slide rules and so forth. And so. Uh, even though we don't see electronic computers until you know World War II, uh, it's important to understand that there was a lot of data being processed prior to that, and so these um, that the reason that there was a, p a possibility of a computing industry was to potentially speed up that sort of unit record business. Um, 
And so remember the big players in the unit record business, the punch card business, were IBM and Remington Rand. And no surprise, both of them became big players in the early days of computing. Um, and so that's kind of the stage upon which these companies uh, were operating. Um, now IBM uh, had a, a various uh, lines of accounting machines and uh, you know essentially punch card machines to to do tabulation and sorting. We don't really consider those computers because uh, they uh, they were not typically programmable, uh, for example, and um, were fairly rudimentary in, in the kind of functionality they could offer. Um, however, it's important to say that as early as um, the 1930s, uh, these tabulating machines from IBM came with removable control plan panels and plug boards. And so you could rewire your tabulating machine to do, to do different kinds of calculations or tabulations um, on your punch card data. You could also have a number of different cards, uh, a number of different um, panels, each of which did some particular task. And there was a, a whole industry of companies that supplied these panels and so you would get an IBM machine and then you get some panels uh, that would each be dedicated to a certain task uh, in, in terms of tabulating and sorting your data and um, you'd replace the panel uh, for each particular kind of run. So um, it, it, there was a lot of automation and um, automatic processing just not of the kind we're familiar with. Um, the scope of it is, is, is really kind of remarkable. Um, in 1955, for example, IBM uh, was producing um, about 72 million punched cards a day. And that they were, they were producing punch cards for people to use in their office machinery. And so there was that much data being um, generated and processed every day. Um, and so what does this tell us? Well, it tells us, first of all, um, the United States as a country and the world, you know, Western Europe, everywhere else, um, companies were getting bigger, businesses getting more complex, um, more and more data. And so certainly there was a need for improved punch card processing, if you will. And um, the electronic computer uh, was seen as a possible way to do that. And so it's, 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 it's real important to remember that that was what drove the early computing industry. It wasn't so much a desire to do better linear algebra and so forth. That's what drove the early research machines. But in terms of actually selling computers um, and, and building an is industry, it, it was about um, supplementing and eventually replacing this, this whole punch card industry. Um, and so IBM, in particular, was very well positioned to do that. And so um, while it may appear that IBM sort of leaps out of nowhere um, because um, we, we, their role with the Harvard Mark uh, I gets a little obscured because of um, you know, Howard Aiken sort of pushing them out of the way, uh, but, but IBM was, was active in uh, computing uh, from the pretty early days and also very involved in this office machinery um, tabulating business which had been what they had been doing since you know since the company was formed I think 1924 I may have said 1928 yesterday but 1924 back then um, so one system that characterizes this um, motivation pretty well I think is the um, known as the IBM 1401 and the IBM 1401 was a, a, a wildly successful system that IBM announced in 1959 and it came with uh, a processor a CPU uh, that was the 1401 and it also came with a card reader that was the 1402 and it came with a printer the 1403 and the idea was that an organization could take their existing uh, tabulating punched card equipment and maybe replace it with a 1401. Um, they made this a possibility by targeting a, a price point for the 1401 that would be competitive with kind of state-of-the-art tabulating machines and also provide better performance. And the number they came up with was $2,500 a month. 
Now, that sounds like a lot. It is a lot. But it was certainly competitive with what organizations would be spending on these automatic office machines that didn't offer, you know, general purpose computing. And um, uh, it, it had some advantages in terms of how much data it could process. And so, um, so the IBM 1401 was a was a was an was a was an interesting machine. Um, in its development, there was some consideration of having it use a plug board, kind of like that office machinery, kind of like the um, ENIAC. But but fortunately, uh, wiser heads, uh, namely uh, Fran Underwood, I think, and, and primarily, uh, realized that this would be a tremendous mistake because programming via control panels is horrible and it limits the usefulness of the machine and it's hard to maintain and it makes it more complicated so they decided to go make the IBM 1401 a, a stored program uh, computer and they called it uh, the acronym was the space machine uh, stored program and calculating engine and it had a number of interesting characteristics from the point of view of its architecture um, it offered a magnetic core um, memory which was by that time standard. That's the kind of memory that, that most computers uh, had. It was transistor based and it, when it was originally being planned that wasn't a hundred percent certain but in 1958 uh, Thomas, uh, Thomas J. Watson um, dictated uh, that IBM would be solid state in 58. That means no more vacuum tubes, everything moving towards transistors and solid state devices and that dictate applied to the 1401 and fortunately so. Um, in terms of how the, the, the machine was constructed, IBM had a um, something they called an uh, SMS card uh, which was a standard modular system. This was a, uh, you picture it as a cube. Uh, it was about 29 by 29 by 31 inches and in that cube you had various uh, circuit boards that uh, gave you the functionality, uh, you know, that, that gave you your ability to compute actually. And um, those cubes and their individual boards could be pulled out, replaced uh, at will. And, and this was important for a, a service-oriented company like IBM, which it was and may still be. Um, companies rented the computers, and as a part of that rental, they got service. And so you don't, if, you, if that's the arrangement that you're making as IBM, you don't want to have, like, repairmen crawling around on the floor trying to replace transistors and stuff. You just you want to do things as quickly as you can. Swap out something and get your customer back up and running. Uh, show yourself to be reliable. And so this kind of modular approach to building um, your machines made that, made that happen. And we, we see that kind of modular development in computers um, continuing and, and certainly how things are done now. Um, it was, the 1401 was kind of a unique architecture uh, because it supported memory-to-memory um, -memory, uh, operations at the assembly level. And typically with assembly um, uh, language, in the instruction set, set architectures, we see that um, we don't do memory-to-memory -memory operations. Um, we, we, we move uh, operands from memory to a register and then operate the, on them and move them back out into memory. In the case of the 1401, there was an accumulator register that stored results, but the operands themselves uh, at the time of computation were in memory. And so you would get the input and write the output all in one step. Now this wasn't necessarily the most efficient way to do things, but it was simpler in terms of programming. And remember, the 1401 was not targeting sort of high performance scientific applications. It was targeting business processing, unit record data, um, and so um, counting up um, information about customers and clients and things like that. And so it was a very reasonable choice uh, for, uh, for the 1401. Um, so um, the 1401 was a massive success, uh, so much so that Honeywell uh, was inspired to create an emulator of the 1401 that they called the Liberator that, um, that, that they offered uh, with one of their machines and so you could get a Honeywell computer and have it running an, in an emulation mode and be able to run 1401 uh, programs um, at a lower cost and so they were kind of trying to undercut IBM and um, 
you know, certainly IBM uh, uh, was concerned about this and, re and reacted to it in various ways. Um, but it shows us something that will become an important theme as computing gets more uh, diverse um, and as we yet want to support interoperability uh, across the machines offered by an individual company or across multiple companies, uh, this, this notion of emulation becomes increasingly important. And emulation is really just uh, a way you, ha you ha an emulator essentially has. Uh, it implements a, uh, an instruction set architecture uh, in uh, some kind of language, high level or assembly language, doesn't matter. But it essentially implements the instruction set architecture so that even if you're running on a different instruction set architecture, you can run the emulator and um, uh, you can you can give a 1401 program to the emulator, and even though your computer may not natively have the IBM 1401 instruction set as its architecture, the emulator makes it look like it does, and so um, uh, that's how we achieve that. And that's certainly something that we see being used um, throughout uh, you know the recent time since then, and uh, is is very akin to techniques that we know now, like virtualization, um, which we can imagine is a, a kind of emulation. It is kind of emulation. Uh, I mentioned the, the 1401 was a, a massive success. One standard of that is that um, in the, in, in the, at some point in the 1960s, there were about 26,000 computers in the world. 15,000 of them uh, were the 1401. So, you know, that's a significant percentage. Uh, and remember, um, you have 15,000 systems out there at $2,500 a month minimum. That's generating about $37 million a month. Um, and so, you know, very successful. Um, the IBM 1401, um, there was a restoration project, as, as there have been for many, of, some, at least some of these kind of popular influential systems. And in fact, um, it, it's, it's been said that Steve Wozniak, the, the great designer of Apple I, Apple II, uh, personal computers, uh, w visited the 1401, was kind of studying it, learning about it, and, and said it was wonderful because you could really, it was simple enough where you could really understand everything about computing by looking at the 1401. And so, you know, coming from someone as accomplished as, as Steve Wozniak, that's, a, that's high praise indeed. Um, the 1401 sounds like a small system. It was advertised as a small system, and it was small compared to other mainframes of the day. But to keep it in perspective, it weighed about four tons. Um, and there were more than 10,000 junction transistors, more than 13,000 point contact transistors, um, and um, those were put on 2,300 um, SMS cards and wired together with five and a half miles of wire. I mean, so, so this, this was not a small, simple system um, from our perspective, but at that time, indeed, it was. Um, so the, this, uh, the 1401 typically came with somewhere between 4K or 16K of RAM, and um, it, it, uh, um, it had a small number of registers and, and used memory-to-memory -memory operations. Um, and so um, it was a, a very interesting and influential uh, design. Um, now it's important maybe to pause for a moment and just we've started using terms like instruction set architecture and operands and registers and things like that. Maybe important to just pause for a moment and, 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 and talk a little bit about what computer architecture looked like in the early 1960s. Um, there were, just to put it in perspective, um, in 1960 about 6,000 general purpose computers in the United States. That's pretty extraordinary, actually. If you think, you know, as of 1945, there was, well, not even one. The ENIAC became operational in 1946. I mean, so in 15 years, you've gone from one to 6,000. So that's pretty, pretty incredible. Uh, what were some characteristics of the architectures of machines at that time? Well, first, the word length, the, 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 the basic, the size of the basic unit of information that, that you process in your computer, be it an instruction or a piece of data, was often variable in its length. And that's something we don't see anymore, but the variable word length, it meant that you would only use as much space as you needed to represent an instruction, and then you would um, 
mark that you were at the end of the instruction or um, uh, as well with a, with a piece of data. So for example, if you were storing the number one, uh, you wouldn't need to use you know eight digits to store the number one. You'd use one digit and then put a marker saying I'm at the end of my data. Now this makes for um, a more complicated instruction set and more complicated control processing, but memory was expensive at that time. And also that model, that way of thinking, was very characteristic of punched cards. Um, punched cards can be viewed as a kind of variable length record where you provide as much information um, uh, as you need to encode, but it, the amount of information per card varies uh, depending on how many holes you've punched and how many fields are represented and so forth. And so, so it, it, it was definitely inspired by that. Um, the variable instruction length um, principle at the assembly language level does lead you into what we later call a complex instruction set computer, or CISC architecture. And that means you have, at the assembly language level, at the instruction set architecture, you have a lot of different kinds of instructions that are perhaps slight variations on each other and allow some fairly powerful functionality. Um, this was important because at that time, most assembly language was written by human beings. And, and human beings like to have um, uh, powerful instructions to work with when they're writing programs. It, it makes life much easier. Um, the word size of these machines, now, they're, they're, while they had a variable word length, there was a limit, right? So you couldn't just say, I want to have you know, 800 digits as a word length. Um, the word lengths were typically 12 to 16 bits. Um, and so um, you, if you're using, um, um, you know, each bit can represent a zero or a one. And so um, the range of values that you can represent there is somewhat limited, uh, basically to, uh, you know, two to the 12th or two to the 16th. Um, and um, this seems, this is constrained. But again, remember, a lot of these machines that were being used at this time were not for high performance scientific computing. They were business applications where the numbers are not extremely large or extremely small. Um, and so this was totally adequate. If you look at some of the upper end mainframes, high end mainframes intended for scientific computing and so forth, there, even in 1960, you see 32, 36 bit word lengths because when you're doing calculations of, uh, you know, atomic blast uh, characteristics and things like that, you do need very precise values. And so um, uh, it just wasn't really necessary for the kind of market, for example, the 1401 was after. Um, these, uh, these machines typically had registers, uh, that is kind of fast memory close to the processor that could be used to store operands um, or instructions. And there was often an accumulator register that was used to keep results in and perhaps augment results as you went through a series of computations to get a single value. Um, there was also often an index register, and the index register would specify a value by which you would increment um, uh, an instruction. Um, and, and the utility of that might seem peculiar, but, but in fact imagine if you were uh, trying to step through an array, uh, being able to set an index register to one and then just do a read operation and then consult the index register, it'll just march you through that array. Um, and so it was kind of a handy, um, a handy uh, uh, thing to have. Um, it's important to remember when we talk about these word lengths, instructions would have to fit into whatever that word length is. And so if you have, let's say, a 12 uh, or 16 bit word length, you have to divide that up. And you typically would divide it up so that some number of bits were the instruction, and then some number of bits would be an operand or perhaps a location to get an operand at. And that's figuring out how to create instructions that would operate your computer, do the things that you wanted to do, um, is, is really designing, designing the instruction set architecture. And, and that's really what, um, from the point of view of computer science, we, we think of an architecture as, is the instruction set architecture. So um, you can have instructions where there is just a single instruction and then perhaps the address of an operand and then the, the presumption is that the second operand may already be in an accumulator. So you might say add, 
you know, um, you know, location 20, um, and the effect of that instruction would be to go to location 20, get the operand, add it to whatever the um, value in the accumulator is, and store it in the accumulator. And then your next instruction could go along and uh, continue the operations based on the presumption that the result of the previous calculation is in the accumulator. Uh, you could have instructions that had um, two addresses in them, an instruction with two operands, and again, you would, you know, get add location 20 to location 30, you would get those values from locations 20 and 30, add them, and store them in the accumulator. And again, there's this presumption that the result of the previous calculation is found in the accumulator, and so you work with that. Um, it can get more and more complicated. Um, the, that two address scheme um, is what the IBM 1401 did, and that's what we mean by memory to memory. So you would have an instruction like add location 20 to location 30, the instruction itself causes the computer to go out to location 20 and 30 in memory, bring those in for calculation, and store them in the accumulator all in one step. So that's a good illustration of what we mean by memory to memory. Um, and um, uh, moving on, you can imagine, well, I can have an instruction with two operands and a location to store, data, store the result in instead of the accumulator. That's great, but remember, if you only have 12 or 16 bits to um, represent these instructions, you're not giving yourself a whole wide range of locations to specify. Um, and I would encourage you to sit down with a draw out a 16-bit um, instruction and, and decide how many bits are you going to give for the instruction? How many for operand 1? How many for operand 2? How many for the location? You don't have that many. And um, y you may find yourself in a situation where, well, I've left myself three bits to specify a location, but that, that means you can only access two to the three or eight different locations. And you probably have a lot more than that. So um, uh, the word length is an important constraint. Um, it really um, defines how much you can do with your instructions. And, um, and, and you may wonder, well, why not just have 50-bit words then? But then supporting that in the, in, the, in the computer itself, being able to process that and manage that and access that much memory potentially and so forth, that adds a burden on the hardware. So there's a, there's a trade-off there between sort of the simplicity of the design and the functionality of the computer. And, um, and, and that's what you see that reflected in the instruction set architecture. Um, there was an instruction set format that Alan Turing was a big fan of, and that was to have the instruction and then the two operands that were going to be operated on, and then the location of the next instruction. And he liked that uh, because uh, it allowed you to um, really program uh, in, a, in, a, in a very efficient way. Um, you could, you could um, um, efficient relative to how your program is actually being stored um, in memory um, and uh, allow you to uh, access, um, access things very quickly by uh, potentially um, moving uh, or, or getting instructions, uh, positioning the instructions on your storage device so that they're not that far away from you when you execute the next instruction, even if they're a branch and so forth. So it's, it's a, a very difficult way to program, uh, and, it, and it did not become a wildly popular format. We don't see this format anymore, but it was, Alan Turing was an advocate of it, and we saw it in an early system, I think, called the Bendix, that was a kind of almost personal computer back in the 19. Uh, 40s and early 50s, uh, but was not popular. Most notable for being a favorite of Alan Turing, perhaps. Um, other characteristics of mainframe computers of the day, um, and and we'd consider the 1401 a mainframe. I mean, it's it's a smaller mainframe, but it's still a mainframe. And and why is that? Well, it it's big. It has you know it has a lot of functionality. Um, and um, one of the characteristics of mainframe systems in the 1950s, 1960s. Uh, an important characteristic is the presence of I.O. channels. And despite the name, an I.O. channel is simply a dedicated computer that helps manage I.O. between your storage and your, um, your mainframe. And this 
was very costly but also very necessary because for example magnetic core memory was quite slow and processors of the day were slow compared to now but they were faster, a lot faster than magnetic core memory and so um, the danger was you could have your, 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 your very expensive $2,500 a month or more computer sitting there idly waiting for data um, and that's real inefficient and so the I.O. channels were meant to kind of be a staging point for data where it, the I.O. computer would go out, get data, store it on its computer and then feed that to the mainframe so that the mainframe was not directly connecting to the peripherals if you will um, and potentially waiting on them for data um, and so so that was a, a big um, a big deal. Um, in addition to magnetic core, uh, we also started to see in the late 1950s, in 1957, IBM introduced uh, the spinning disk uh, as, a, as, a, as a storage medium. And these were much bigger than our disk drives of today, but the principle is very much the same. You had a, a kind of, a, in, that case, in that case, an aluminum disk that data could be written on and it would spin around uh, under a read-write head and data would be accessed by that. So that was a lot slower. That's a mechanical operation. That's a lot slower than a CPU. So to have a disk drive like that connected to your mainframe, you'd need these channels. And the channels themselves were expensive, and so was the mainframe, so was the storage devices, and so forth. Um, the, the, um, the Model 305 disk drive from IBM um, uh, was able to store 5 million characters, which that's quite a bit of data. Um, and it consisted of 50 aluminum disks, and uh, they were 24 inches in diameter. Um, so, you know, this was, this was not a small thing. This was a big, you know, stack of platters basically spinning around and, um, and provided the increased uh, peripheral um, data storage uh, in addition to magnetic core. Um, and so by the time we hit 1960, by the time the 1401 is introduced, um, IBM was in a pretty dominant position. And they would stay in that position uh, throughout much of the 60s and 70s, and even into the 1980s. Um, and so the story of commercial computing after World War II includes a lot of discussion of IBM, because that was just where a lot of the dominant activity was, a lot of the innovations. IBM was both a hardware and a software company, and so they were developing hardware, they were developing operating systems, they were developing peripheral devices, um, and so you know that's why we spend a lot of time talking about IBM. Um, and so on the high end of computing, I me we've mentioned the 1401, which is kind of a, meant to be sort of a smaller mainframe, if you will. On the high end, in let's say 1960, IBM offered um, the 7090. And that was a transistorized version of its 709 processor, which came out in the 1950s. And this had a 36-bit word length. And so when you look at computers of that day, if you look at the word length, you can immediately figure out what kind of market it was targeting. 32, 36-bit word length, guess what? Scientific computing. Um, 12, 16-bit, probably more business applications. Um, the 7090 uh, had a price tag of about $2 million, um, and I'm sure you know a rental plan could be worked out, but, but this was an expensive, these were expensive uh, machines, custom, uh, custom built in effect, um, you know, that uh, uh, you, you weren't selling these in stores, for example. Um, it's also important to remember in this era 1950s, 1960s, we talk about mainframe computing, we're talking about batch processing. Okay, so computing was not interactive. Um, and we are so accustomed to interactive computing now, it may be difficult to conceive of what batch processing is. But it's real simple. Um, you, if, you, if you were a programmer and you had a program to run, you would write your program out, maybe even by hand, uh, have it punched onto cards, and uh, then you'd take your deck of cards to the computer operations center and you'd slide it in a slot or put it in a queue or whatever and your job would be queued up with all the other jobs that were waiting to be run and there would be human operators who were loading uh, cards let's say reading them into a card reader that might put them onto a tape or onto a disk and then finally when it was the turn of your program to run 
one of these I.O. channels would take over and get your program and take it to the mainframe and then the mainframe would, would try and run it. Um, if there was an error, uh, you missed a semicolon or whatever, your program would fail and there would be a message given, a printout uh, created and that would be delivered to you maybe the next day. Um, and so um, computers of this time were not doing time sharing or multi multi uh, multitasking. One program would run at a time and um, once a program was started it, w it would run to completion. There was really no notion of virtual memory, time sharing, anything like that. Virtual memory is where we have multiple programs um, running on a system at the same time and maybe some of them are actually being run and stored in memory while others of them that are waiting to be run may be stored out on the disk. And we do that commonly now, but at this time that wasn't the case. And so it's just important to remember that was the nature of computing at this time. It was not an interactive experience at all. Um, it, it was, um, you know, the mainframe. You may, not have ever, you may not have seen the mainframe or come in contact with it. It was behind closed doors served by its acolytes and operators and so forth and and so you were not personally engaging with that system and that's how it was um, so so IBM uh, had a runaway success with a 1401 and despite that um, just a few years later in 1964 announced the IBM 360 project and the 360 um, system was a huge moment for IBM, a huge moment for computing. It was what we'd call a bet the company moment, uh, where IBM was staking its future success and, and maybe very existence on the success of the 360. Now what was the, what was the concept? The concept, or the issue, the problem that IBM was facing is that while they had great success with the 1401, the 7090, other systems, they were all incompatible. They all had different instruction set architectures, and there's really a kind of limit to what you can do with emulation, um, and it doesn't bond your customers to you. So if a customer has a 1401 and they grow dissatisfied with it for some reason, there's nothing compatible that you can offer them. And so they're, they, they realize that if they buy a new system from IBM, they're going to have to kind of start over, and they may as well take a look at what Honeywell offers and everybody else. And so IBM kind of wanted to keep people in the family. And so the 360, 360 refers to the uh, degrees in a circle. And so the, the slogan, if you will, was that the 360 system would surround you um, and satisfy all of your needs. Um, and that could be reassuring or maybe creepy, depending on how you viewed IBM and its intentions to you. But their intentions were to keep you and so that if you bought a smaller system that you outgrew, they could say, well, you know what, let's just step up here to the next um, machine in the 360 line. So the idea was that the, three, that there would, the 360 was not a single machine, or um, it was a line of machines that were all compatible, that the, the programs that ran on the highest end would run on the lowest end, and vice versa. And that's challenging because those high-end machines have a lot of functionality that a low-end machine won't offer. That's why they're high and low-end machines, right? But IBM was saying, making a promise here, we're going to be compatible. And the way they achieved that was effectively a kind of emulation, or what we'll call microprogramming. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we move along here. Um, but um, so IBM spent about five billion dollars on the 360 project. This was almost two times as much as the company took in in 1962. And that's not profits, that's just total revenue. So they were spending twice as much money as they um, made in a single year, as they brought in. It's not even profit. So it's just an enormous investment and, uh, and very high stakes. Um, and, and so why would you do that? I mean, you had all of these, uh, you know, successful products, and yeah, they weren't compatible, but you're successful. And to some extent, yeah, right, there's a, there's a risk there in making change. There's always, change means risk, and change is hard. But there's also a risk in not doing anything. 
Uh, and oftentimes the risk of not doing anything turns out to be greater. And IBM was astute enough as an organization to realize that the computing industry was changing, it was moving fast, and that if they simply rested on their laurels, it would pass them by. And so they, you know, they, 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 they rolled the dice. And the 360 was a, another wonderful success. Um, the the three, 360 system started being delivered in 1965. Um, by 1970, IBM, IBM revenues had doubled, largely due to the 360. Um, in 1970, there were 35,000 360 uh, systems installed. Uh, and, and so it was a, it was a, a big success. Um, during the 1960s, IBM had 70% of the market share, the computing market share, which is enormous, uh, such a large share that the United States government was frequently engaging in antitrust actions against IBM, which they had to deal with over the course of the 1960s, 1970s. Um, and so, wonderful success. And a key part of that success was this scalability. And it, you know, there's kind of a cunning marketing angle here too, where you're IBM and you can say, well, yeah, we're going to sell people the lowest system in our 360 line, knowing full well they're going to outgrow it, and then we'll just upgrade them. And the upgrade will be easy because it's compatible, and they won't want to go anywhere else because if they do, they're going to have to uh, start over, basically. And so quite, quite shrewd. Um, from a technical point of view, it was a hard problem. And, and, and folks as, as brilliant as Gene Omdahl, chief architect of the 360 system, and Fred Brooks, uh, author of Mythical Man Month, which is actually a book about software engineering based on the experience of the 360, um, were skeptical, actually. Weren't quite sure how to do it. And then they rediscovered this idea that I mentioned, this idea of microprogramming, that, that really saw its early, um, an early uh, use and successful use in Morris Wilkes' EDSAC machine, which was, remember, the first steadily running stored program computer. And, um, and the idea of microprogramming, uh, it's certainly related to this notion of emulation, but with microprogramming the idea is that you implement the low-level instruction set architecture of a machine um, in um, a microcode uh, that, that you can run on each of these machines. And so each of these machines, the microcode, makes each machine look like, look the same. And, and it presents to the, the system the face of the 360 um, instruction set. Now it might be on the lower end systems some of the instructions that are available in the 360 architecture wouldn't be available natively. Like let's just imagine there's like a floating point multiply. You get floating point multiply in the high end uh, native like meaning that the instruction that does that in the assembly language uh, is very directly implemented in hardware. Maybe the low end doesn't give you a floating point multiply, but it gives you via microcode the ability to write a floating point multiply and then in the microcode a subroutine if you will is implemented that will do the floating point multiply for you with whatever that low end machine offers. And now how can we do that? How can we, how can we believe in that? Well, that's where Alan Turing comes into play. Universal Turing machine, right? Anything one computer can compute, another can, um, especially if they're stored program computers. And so it is certain, Alan Turing reassures us, it is certain that we can do this, uh, that the simplest program, the simplest computer, uh, and the Turing machine is the simplest of all computers because it's just um, this is a it doesn't exist in real life really it's a, a theoretical model but it's just a paper tape moving over a read write head uh, writing out zeros and ones and that can implement anything so if that can implement anything anything a computer can implement if that can implement anything certainly a low-end 360 can implement what a high-end 360 does but people sometimes lose sight of that um, but it's, it's, it's fascinating sometimes. One of the things that is nice about some of the sort of retro computing that we see now is that you'll see people doing kind of weird things like running modern algorithms, if you will, on really old hardware. And it doesn't run terribly quickly, but it runs. 
And it should run because Alan Turing tells us it should. And so one example I think I saw recently was a 1401, actually. I think it was an IBM 1401, was running code for mining bitcoins. And obviously at the time the 1401 was developed, they didn't know about that. And it's complicated, but guess what? You can do it. And there's no algorithm. If you can you know, pick your favorite implementation algorithm from your favorite hardware of today, there's a way to implement that on any other stored program computer that existed or will exist. So it's a remarkable result, actually. Uh, Alan Turing's result there is remarkable um, and very powerful. Um, the 360 also offered, in addition to supporting all the different levels of its line, it also offered emulation of the 1401. And that was to allow all those 1401 customers to move into the 360 family. Um, uh, again, a very kind of cunning, not cunning, a reasonable, a reasonable um, approach from a kind of marketing and salesmanship point of view. You don't want to antagonize your existing customer base by saying, well, no, we're going to discontinue the 1401 and you're going to have to buy a new, completely new system and redo everything you've done. Um, so they, they weren't doing that. Um, so some of the characteristics of the 360 instruction set architecture, and remember this applied to all the different levels of machine in the 360 line, is that it offered 16 general purpose registers. And now this is a little different to what we were describing earlier, where we, t we had some special purpose registers like an accumulator and an index register. Now with general purpose registers, they can be used for anything. And there are 16 of those. Um, the word length is 32 bits. And that's kind of interesting because the 7090 had a 36-bit word length. The 360 had a 32-bit word length, which is a word length that we've seen up into modern times. Um, and because 32 is a power of 2, that has a lot of simplifying characteristics, especially when computers are now all dealing with binary issues. By this time, the issue of decimal versus binary has been settled, and it's been settled saying that computers are binary. And so using um, powers of two um, become your friend and your tool when um, you're dealing with uh, binary numbers. And so 32-bit word length was simplification. Um, IBM chose to use the EBCDIC character set that it developed with the 360. And this was an 8-bit character set. Uh, so you could specify up to 2 to the 8th different uh, characters. Um, and that was in competition with the ASCII character set, which was a 7-bit character set. So the EBCDIC character set had 2 to the 8th um, different um, characters. Um, ASCII only had 2 to the 7th. And for whatever reason, IBM made the EBCDIC character set incompatible with ASCII. And that was probably not a wise decision um, because it later on caused some compatibility issues and, and even at the time would cause compatibility issues with the ASCII character set. Um, and so um, the uh, typical um, uh, the, the, the instruction set architecture allowed 24 bits for direct addressing of memory locations. That is you specify the actual location in memory. You have up to 24 bits to do that. So 2 to the 24th locations in memory can be accessed and um, also provided, um, can be accessed directly, also provided mechanisms for different kinds of indirect addressing if you had more than 2 to the 24th locations in memory. Um, and 2 to the 24th is about 16 million, I think. So uh, if you had um, you know, more than um, 16 million locations in memory to access, you would need to use some kind of indirect addressing, which was supported. Um, 360 again, like all mainframes of the day, use channels for I.O. Uh, as we mentioned, it did not offer time sharing. Uh, as a result, it did not offer, because it didn't need to, I guess, uh, dynamic address translation, uh, which is sort of the hardware mechanism that enables uh, virtual memory. Uh, it, it allows you to essentially stop a program, move it out from memory to disk, and bring another program in. Since the 360 wasn't offering time sharing, it didn't really need to offer dynamic address translation, but the fact that it didn't made it kind of impossible to make the 360 a time sharing system, which it never was. Um, and it, the 360 system did not use integrated circuits. 
Um, so integrated circuits had been around since, they'd been known of since 1960, 61, starting to become available, but were extremely expensive and just not in 1965, not at a point where you could put them into a commercial product that was meant for businesses and so forth. It just, it just wasn't feasible. Instead, um, instead, what IBM offered was what they called their solid logic technology, which was a um, very actually kind of sophisticated process for um, putting transistors on a circuit board and, and um, you know, doing so very efficiently. And so um, uh, they had, uh, this was a replacement to that um, SMS system that I mentioned that the 1401 used. So, so IBM was continuing to do everything in-house, continuing to think about new ways to package their, their chips and other electronics and doing so in an efficient way that allowed for kind of convenient support of those systems and, and doing quite a lot with that. Um, one thing that's um, true about the System 360 is that they, they tried to cover as much of the market as they could, but they kind of missed on both ends, and they kind of missed deliberately, I think, or they knew they weren't going to be able to cover both ends. Um, the, on the high end, um, big kind of high-profile computing users like research labs or maybe the military, you know, like um, Los Alamos National Laboratory um, wouldn't necessarily be using a 360 system, even the high end, because what they were doing required a lot of mathematical and scientific support. And this is where we kind of see the beginnings of a, of a supercomputing industry, if you will, and that would cater to a few well-funded, high-profile, kind of admired customers and that, that would increase the you know, profile of whoever supplied the machine. So certainly IBM tried to get into that supercomputing marketplace, but they were not quite as successful because it w wasn't really their focus. Um, control Data, CDC, um, was very successful in that market, that high-end, high-profile marketplace. Um, and CDC, Control Data, was a, a, a Minnesota Twin Cities company. Um, and uh, we mentioned a while ago Seymour Cray, the famous architect Seymour Cray. Seymour Cray went from ERA to Control Data. And um, one, of the, one of the very popular systems that, um, that CDC offered uh, was the 660. And that was introduced in 1964. And that was not a system that your local department store or... Um, you know, whatever would, would buy. This is something that Los Alamos National Laboratories would buy, the Pentagon would buy, um, people like that. And so it increased CDC's profile as well as that of, of Seymour Cray without necessarily turning CDC into a, a monster sized company uh, because there aren't that many sort of high profile, well funded installations out there. So it's sort of like glory versus profit, I guess. And IBM was lapping up the profits. Um, Control Data was a big player in the supercomputing marketplace throughout the 60s. And then in 1972, Seymour Cray left CDC and um, formed Cray Computer, Cray Computing, Cray Research, uh, and moved it uh, back to his hometown of Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin, where it, um, and the Cray, um, we, we don't talk a great deal about, about the Cray systems here because um, they were, they were, while they were high profile and, and had a lot of innovations, uh, they were a very specialized um, select subset of the computing marketplace and um, they um, didn't necessarily have too much influence on the more mainstream computing other than sort of being a source of admiration. You know, they were kind of inspiring um, and there's a lot of interesting facts there. Um, so 1972 we have Cray Research going out and um, uh, offering supercomputers that, um, again, were appealing to uh, certain select customers. Um, and in 1970, actually, Gene Omdahl left IBM. Gene Omdahl, chief architect of the 360, left Omdahl, uh, left IBM and formed the Omdahl Computer Corporation and began creating essentially IBM uh, 360 and then 370 uh, clones. And, um, and so while IBM was in a dominant position, there was competition. There was, it was, you know, it was on a small scale, but there was competition, and they, they did have to—they did have to consider that. Um, 
so at at the high end, the 360 system had maybe not as much appeal as in the middle end. And the 360 system did not reach down to users and organizations that just weren't very well funded at all. I mean, you know, if you're if you're having to spend thousands of dollars a month on a computer, that places it out of reach for a lot of organizations, um, particularly universities, um, you know, maybe some government entities, uh, local government, um, and um, uh, some research labs that maybe aren't, you know, super high profile, super funded and stuff. And so there was a market there that IBM uh, certainly knew about but chose not to reach down into, not with the 360 line, because it might have just required too many compromises in terms of how do you make programs on that upper end run on the lower end. That may just not have been feasible. And they also, I'm certain, didn't want to take the route of introducing a separate line for those low-end customers, because then if you tried to upgrade them, well, they're on a separate line. That's why you created the 360 line to begin with. So, um, so they chose to sort of leave that market th al alone. And as often happens, um, there were organizations willing to kind of step in. Um, and, and, and this is where we see the beginning of the mini computer. And mini computer is not a term that we use um, now, except when talking about this era. Uh, but mini computers were meant to occupy that space below the mainframe, um, you know, back in the late 1950s, 1960s, um, and just to provide a little bit of coverage. So you can kind of imagine a layer cake, if you will, of a, a thin layer of cream and the supercomputers from CDC, let's say, the big meaty kind of middle, a meaty cake, if you can imagine that, of the IBM 360 line. And then sort of at the, the, the crust, if you will, to, to complete the cake analogy, um, the meaty cake analogy um, was the mini computers. Um, and that was sort of the spectrum of, of computing. Uh, we, we were not anywhere near personal computing a, in, in, at this time. There were some people, places envisioning it, but it, it wasn't something that was commercially available for sure. And so um, remember that System 360, 32-bit word length, the 70, 90, 36 bits, um, mini computers um, went with a smaller word length, uh, 12 to 16 bits. And that is because a mini computer to reach that lower price is not going to be able to support a huge amount of memory. And uh, you're going to have more limited functionality. But you're going to get it to a price where maybe people who wouldn't have any kind of computer at all will at least have one now. And so, so, so there was some incentive to try and do that. Um, one of the first mini computers actually came from CDC. Uh, so CDC was kind of in the upper and lower ends of our, of our, our cake there. And um, Seymour Cray uh, was the principal designer of it. This was the CDC 160, 160 that was introduced in 1960, actually. Um, and this had a 12-bit word length and direct access to 8K of RAM, uh, so 8,000, you know, um, 8,000 memory locations, um, and it was considered quite cheap at $60,000 in 1960. Um, so again, even if, that's why I say we weren't thinking here about personal computing in the sense of individuals having computers. Um, th these were still intended for organizations, but an investment of $60,000 is quite a bit less than what it would cost to buy a mainframe from CDC or to rent a system from IBM, and so um, so th so there was a, a space there. Um, historically, what we see in the mini, mini computers are often associated with DEC or Digital Electronic Digital Electronic Corporation, and DEC was formed in 1957, uh, founded by Ken Olson and Harlan Anderson, and DEC was based in Maynard, Massachusetts, um, and had numerous kind of connections with MIT. Um, which is where Ken Olson had been. And DEC was going after this mini computer market. Um, Ken Olson had had some experience at MIT with computing and more interactive computing on kind of experimental systems and, and thought that there was a market for this. And he turned out to be right. Um, in 1959, DEC made their first offering, if you will, um, of a system called the PDP, 
uh, one. And I think PDP may have stand so for like personal data processing or something like that. But the PDP line uh, we'll see throughout the 1960s and was tremendously influential, tremendously popular, and really to some extent kind of beloved. It was one of those systems that you know people grew attached to, in part or maybe in large part because it supported a very personal kind of interactive uh, relationship with your machine. And so instead of having a big, ma big mainframe behind glass doors that you never actually saw, with these m mini computers, you as a user might interact with it directly. And maybe in a way that seems very primitive now, like by flipping switches. A lot of the times your interactions were flipping switches to, to enter data and programs and stuff. But you could do that. And, and people grew very fond of that. Um, the the PDP-1 could do 100,000 operations a second. Now this was not as fast as the mainframes or the scientific computers for certain, but 100,000 operations a second. And remember how many could the ENIAC carry out? ENIAC was doing about 5,000 operations a second in 1946, which was fast, right? That's a lot of operations. But in the space of 15 years, we see an increase, a 20 times increase in terms of the number of um, operations. And there we're comparing a, a $500,000, you know, ENIAC to um, uh, a, a somewhat smaller uh, PDP-1. Uh, PDP-1 cost about $120,000. So um, it was uh, five times less expensive and 20 times more uh, speedy in terms of operations. And that's a dynamic that, of course, we, we've grown accustomed to in commuting, right? Things get cheaper, they get faster. So it's a, it's a, great, it's a great thing. Um, and um, uh, one of the key, if uh, these, these distinctions between mini computers, mainframes, and things like that can sometimes get blurry. Um, it's important to think about mini computers being more interactive, allowing individual users um, on a hardware level, uh, they were smaller, had smaller word lengths, smaller amounts of memory, um, but maybe a crucial difference to keep in mind is that many computers didn't use I.O. channels. I.O. channels would be prohibitively expensive, and so they didn't use I.O. channels to, man to manage their I.O. Instead, uh, they used uh, what we now call uh, direct memory access. And, and this is where the, the computer itself, the CPU itself, is managing its I.O and is reading or writing data from a memory or a disk or a tape or whatever while it's doing something else. And so um, the, 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 the computer is in a way multitasking. It is, not in a way, it is multitasking by reading and writing data at the same time it's doing other work. And so we don't hit that slowdown that we did in mainframe computing where the mainframe would have to sit and wait for the data to arrive. And that's just due to differences in how the machines were implemented. Um, but direct memory access is what we, I mean, we use that now. I mean, that, 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 that's, you know, that's what we, that's what we do. And so um, the other thing that DEC did early on throughout its life is that they promoted an open architecture and um, encouraged their users to tinker with the machines. Uh, you could open them up, you could change code, you could do what you wanted. IBM really discouraged that. Um, and in part because IBM typically was providing service through some kind of rental arrangement. And so um, you can understand perhaps why they didn't want you prying off the top of the computer or something. Uh, but a very different attitude. And again, one that would probably, you can imagine, a user might have a warmer feeling about a computer that it, it can interact with, where it can see all the internal specifications, uh, where you can change it around if you want. Um, so it was kind of a wonderful, wonderful change from the IBM philosophy. Um, DEC continued to develop interesting mini computers throughout the 1960s. Uh, 1965 marked the PDP-8, uh, which was a um, mini computer that a lot of, a lot of people um, used, grew attached to. Uh, over 50,000 of those ended up being installed. Um, it had a 12-bit word length, again, like the CDC 160 from five years ago. And that was just the nature of mini computers. It's how you, um, you kept them inexpensive. Um, and, and while that might seem like a um, 
you know, an unreasonably small word length. Uh, the PDP-8, you could buy one for $18,000. Um, and so the fact that you could buy any kind of computer at all for $18,000 was kind of a miracle, right? The PDP-1 uh, we mentioned, that was $120,000. And, um, you know, the bigger mainframes and things, if you could buy them at all, were, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars. And so this was really affordable relative to the costs of other um, systems. Uh, since it had um, the 12-bit word length, only seven bits were given over to addresses, and so you could access two to the seventh or 128 um, uh, words of storage directly, that is by just specifying the location, but then it also provided a lot of methods for indirect addressing in case you had more than 128 words of memory, which you might do. And in particular, what was done in the PDP-8, which was interesting, is that memory was divided up into pages, where each page was 2 to the 7th in size. Uh, so you could have a 128-word page, and you could have a bunch of those pages, and then through different instructions you could specify which page you wanted, and then say, give me the 15th location in page 27, and thereby expand the range of addresses you could uh, access over what you could get via direct uh, addressing. Um, the PDP-8 was also, in terms of its size, kind of remarkable. It was eight cubic feet, um, and it weighed about 250 pounds. So it's kind of like a large, a large human being, a larger human being. Um, and uh, again, the price of eighteen thousand dollars is pretty extraordinary. Um, so DAC was becoming successful. Um, and uh, it was selling a lot of these, um, a lot of these mini computers, and um, and and doing quite well. Um, now the mini computers, um, because really they 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 began to exist in the late 1950s, early 1960s, were transistor based from the beginning, and that gave them an advantage over some of the other offerings of other companies, like remember the 7090 was a transistorized version of the 709 uh, from IBM. And when you're kind of doing a retrofit of a design, a vacuum tube computer, trying to transistorize it, you're going to make some compromises to achieve uh, your goal of, of creating this transistorized machine, starting with a vacuum tube foundation. When you start off with a transistor-based design, you can do things in a way that makes sense for transistors, and that's going to make a cleaner design and a and a better design. And so um, DAC was able to kind of capitalize on that and, and really was known for, for considerable expertise in hardware and architecture and, and, and doing some really nice things with design. Um, and, and you have to do that. If you want to have a successful, inexpensive um, system, it has to be done well, right? Um, so throughout the 1960s, the computers that w we're now in the era of the computer, uh, the transistorized computer. So transistors were being used on a wide scale. Um, in the 1950s, 1940s, this is more so the vacuum tube era. Um, but as we get into the 1960s, that transition to transistors um, had taken place. Um, now, the next wave was underway, even. Uh, back uh, when the mini-computer um, um, push was, was starting. Um, and and by, that, by the next wave, I mean integrated circuits. And integrated circuits um, were the next wave and remain the current wave. Um, so, so what happened with integrated circuits um, years ago um, has a direct impact on us now because we use integrated circuits um, even still. And so integrated circuits can be dated back to 1959. Um, and uh, two separate organizations, two separate individuals, um, Robert Noyce of Fairchild Semiconductor and Jack Kilby of Texas Instruments filed patents for the integrated circuit. And they were both granted patents on different aspects of the design and so forth. Um, but, um, but that's kind of when we date the um, uh, the creation or the invention of the integrated circuit. And the idea of the integrated circuit is fairly simple. It's just instead of having a whole lot of discrete components, like having a bunch of transistors that you individually place on 
a circuit board or some kind of ceramic plate, um, you have, uh, and, and, and along with that, having capacitors and things like that, diodes and all that, um, as discrete entities, you essentially implement the transistor, the capacitors, all those entities in a single piece of silicon. And so you no longer have um, these discrete, discrete components. You have an integrated circuit. Um, and um, that was a, a revolutionary uh, development. Um, and um, it, it brings us to um, a little bit of Silicon Valley lore, if you will. Um, Silicon Valley can be um, really dated back into the 1950s. Uh, William Shockley, one of the co-inventors of the transistor, left Bell Labs in the mid-1950s uh, to start Shockley Semiconductor. And he did that out in his uh, hometown of, I'm not don't remember the hometown, but it was in the area that we now know of Silicon Valley, kind of San Francisco, south of the San Francisco Bay. Um, and William Shockley was a brilliant man, and uh, he hired a great team for Shockley Semiconductor, and then promptly alienated all of them. Uh, he was apparently a difficult man to work for and to work with. Um, and, uh, and so Shockley Semiconductor uh, existed as a company for some time, but um, really after about 18 months at Shockley Semiconductor, a key group of employees, uh, referred to by William Shockley as the Traitorous Eight, uh, left uh, his company to form their own company called Fairchild Semiconductors. And among the Traitorous Eight were some of the bigger names in computing in the last half of the 20th century, including Gordon Moore of Moore's Law fame and Robert Noyce of Integrated Circuit fame. Uh, Gordon Moore, Robert Noyce would go on to be founders of Intel in 1968 and have had enormous influence on computing and life actually, life itself, um, in, in, in their careers. Um, now, um, uh, this core group left um, Shockley and started Fairchild Semiconductor and they were in the transistor business. Right, transistors by the mid 1950s were um, commodities that you could you could sell, um, and they um, um, you know they were trying to find a, a, a niche in that market. Um, Bell Labs had created um, in 1955 something they called the Mesa transistor, which was looks a bit like a Mesa as you see in the southwest of the United States, so a little a sort of a, a, a mountain with the top sort of sawed off. And then on the top of that flattened mountain, a picture a couple of antennas. Uh, these were the contacts for the emitter and the base of the transistor. And then at the bottom, if you will, at ground level, you would have the collector. And remember we talked a little bit about how transistors and vacuum tubes worked, where by controlling the flow of electrons, um, negative electrons through uh, silicon uh, or germanium, uh, depending on the material you're using, um, you can um, represent zeros and ones and amplify sounds and do all kinds of interesting things. So Bell Labs had this Mesa transistor that uh, Fairchild tried to work with, as did others, but those little antenna, those little junctions at the top, were problematic because they collected foreign matter, dust, and so forth, and so it was hard to produce them in a real reliable way. And so um, 1957, 58, 59, Fairchild was working on the idea of a planar transistor where you have a kind of similar structure to that Mesa um, transistor, except you bury the antennae, if you will, in a layer of silicon oxide that protects it um, and yet still allows uh, the charge, if you will, to be applied and received. Um, and so that was a, a, a big step forward, and, and, and Fairchild was able to, to start making some money with these transistors. Um, and it led as well fairly naturally, I think. Um, well, not naturally, but, but in retrospect, one can see that the planar integrated circuit, which was Fairchild's take on the integrated circuit, um, follows the same principle um, of making 
a perfectly flat silicon surface that has a lot of uh, transistors in effect implemented within it. Um, and so um, Robert Noyce conceived of the idea in 1959. By 1961, they were producing them. And now, early on, these were expensive. I mean, any new technology is, is outrageously expensive, usually. And transistors were no exception. And so um, how did they manage to exist as a company? Well, they had a group of customers who had an incentive to spend a lot to achieve the advantages of the transistor over, let's say, vacuum tubes, meaning that they were small and they were more reliable. And those customers included the United States military and the United States space program. And so the United States military, remember this is 1960, so what's happening in 1960? Well, the Soviet Union is a big fearsome force in the world, um, as is the United States, to be fair. And Sputnik, Soviet Union to launch Sputnik 1957, beating the United States into space. Um, John Kennedy, early in his inauguration address, in fact, uh, which would have been in early 1961, said, we're going to go to the moon. How do you get stuff to the moon? You launch it into space. Do you launch vacuum tubes into space? Probably not. Not reliable enough, too big, going to result in you know, components that are way too, I mean, launch the ENIAC into space. It's, it's not going to work. And so NASA space program was desperate for ways to make things smaller, reliable, and to weigh as little as possible. That's what transistors offered. Um, United States Air Force was at that time engaged in the creation of the Minuteman uh, missile system to defend the United States against Soviet attack from missiles, which was a very real fear. Um, the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962 had people in the United States building and hiding in bomb shelters uh, afraid of missiles coming and destroying them. It was, you know, it, it was a different, uh, we have different kinds of fears now, and I suppose at some level we should still be afraid of missiles, but it's not quite as looming a fear um, now, but at the time it was. And so if you had to spend a hundred dollars to get, you know, a few transistors, you did it. Um, because first you're defending the country, second you're um, advancing the country in, into space and so forth. So there were customers, and they were well-heeled, highly motivated customers. And so Fairchild was fortunate, um, as the whole you know, semiconductor uh, silicon industry was, that, that they were there. I mean, the fact that as a country we were worried about missiles wasn't a good thing, but this is perhaps one happy side effect of that, um, especially since the missiles never really came. So, um, so anyway. Um, and so integrated circuits were even better than transistors. And so by the time Fairchild was producing integrated circuits in 1961, the military and NASA were there, ready to buy them. And so a single gate integrated circuit at that time cost about $100. That's one logic gate for $100. You could get that um, in a discrete component, a transistor, for about $3. And so these integrated circuits were f ridiculously expensive by comparison, but worth it for a few select customers. Um, now. Fairchild, and in particular Robert Noyce, realized that their products were very expensive and made a, a kind of one of these bet the company decisions to actually start selling integrated circuits lower than their cost to make them. And the strategy there was let's create a demand. And once that demand is created, we'll stay in business because people keep wanting to buy more and more of them. And it's a very kind of gutsy decision, but it was successful. It did spur. Um, people to move to and use integrated circuits and um, you know we see the result of that and you know the enormous profitability of Intel in the current era for example um, and so as the 1960s proceed integrated circuits were still way too expensive by the time we hit 360 in 1965 IBM wasn't going to use integrated circuits they were still too expensive it wasn't really until about 1970 71 72 that the price became appealing 
and that had some major impacts that we'll see very soon here. Um, other things happening, 1965, Gordon Moore, a Fairchild at that time, uh, wrote an uh, article kind of thinking about the future and described what later became known as Moore's Law. And in effect says the number of transistors that we can fit onto a particular sized piece uh, chip uh, is going to double every 18 months. He originally said I think every year, but later revised that to every 18 months. But the idea is doubling over a fixed period of time, that's exponential growth. So Gordon Moore in 1965 says our ability to squeeze transistors into a particular area is going to grow at an exponential rate. And it turned out he was right. That's turned out to be true for 50 years. And the article that he wrote is quite fascinating because he, he makes some, at the time, maybe kind of far-fetched projections um, um, that turn out to be true if you accept the premise of a doubling of the number of transistors every year or 18 months. And, uh, and, and so uh, Moore's Law starts to kick in, um, 1965, and we'll see that Moore's Law is one of the dominant forces in computing and totally reshapes the computing landscape um, by the time we reach the present era. So it's, it's, a, it's a powerful force that has been identified in 1965 by Gordon Moore. Of course, the force is really more so the integrated circuit. Gordon Moore is kind of drawing attention to that, that the number of transistors we can get into a integrated circuit is going to double. That's, you know, that's, that's, that's really what's driving things. It's not Moore's Law per se, but Moore's Law is describing what's driving things. Um, and so Moore's Law, initially kind of a curiosity perhaps, nobody knew if it was going to be true or not. Um, there was another law out there at the time called Grosch's Law. And Herb Grosch was an IBM um, um, em employee, a programmer, I think. And he posed in various places a, a law that, a, 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 a so-called law, a system that is twice as big gets four times as much performance. And so that's important because if you're a company thinking, okay, I, I have X amount of dollars to spend on computing. Let me buy two small systems, or two smaller systems, and, uh, uh, and I'll get twice as much performance than one. And IBM would say, well, yeah, that's true. But you know what? If you buy one bigger system with that money, you're going to get four times as much performance. So doesn't that make more sense? And indeed, it did. Uh, and indeed, this was true. Um, and it was largely true because of the nature of memory in the 1950s, 1960s. Remember, we're talking about magnetic core memory. And magnetic core memory, very reliable, but high overhead in terms of the, the, the mechanics and the circuitry required to, to, to operate it. And that would be regardless of the amount of memory you had. So whether you had a little bit of memory or a lot of memory, there was a high fixed overhead cost for operating that. And so if you bought a bigger system with bigger memory, the percentage of your money that you're spending on that overhead to support the memory actually goes down. And so this, this was true. And this is one of the things that kept driving the mainframe business is that people didn't have the option of saying, OK, well, I'm going to buy you know, two different systems, two small systems, and, and, and get a big bang in performance. You, you weren't. You were going to get twice as much, which is great. But a mainframe was offering more than that. Um, now, this changed. Um, Grosch's Law is no longer true, for reasons we'll talk about. But um, uh, it's, it's important to know that it was out there. And it was affecting, it would certainly affect decisions that were made by people purchasing systems and recommending system purchases and so forth. Um, so, um, so then, kind of back to mini computers a little bit. Remember that first generation of mini computers in the early 1960s? Uh, we're looking at 12-bit word length. Very constraining, made the systems rather small. By the time we get to the mid to end of the 1960s, we're, we're looking at 16-bit mini computers. And there were a couple of notable um, members of that class. Uh, in particular, the Data General Nova 
was a 16-bit mini computer that was introduced in 1968, um, followed in mid-1971 by the Supernova. Uh, again, a very influential, popular, um, well-designed system. Um, and uh, we also, um, in 1970, DEC uh, moved into the 16-bit mini computer space with the PDP-11, which was a very influential and significant system uh, for, for reasons that we will see soon. Um, now, concurrent with these 16-bit mini computers, we also see in 1970 Intel introducing memory as an integrated circuit. And that was a big deal. Um, and it's a big deal for a lot of reasons. Um, think, though, about Moore's Law and Grotius Law. If you believe in Moore's Law, integrated circuit for memory means that I'm going to get twice as many transistors on my memory chip every 18 months. That means more memory. If Moore's Law turns out to be true, that's great. And think about how we explain Grotius Law. Grotius Law had a lot to do with the overhead of memory, magnetic core memory. But when we talk about silicon memory, the overhead is not nearly as much. And so if you get more memory, there's not a, the, the overhead is not that high. And so you can get a smaller system that isn't being overwhelmed by the overhead to run a little bit of memory. Um, it's proportional. And so, uh, so, so this had a very liberating effect. Um, so the first integrated circuit uh, RAM, dynamic RAM, uh, allowed you to store uh, 1,024 bits. Um, and it was the 1103 was the model, if you will. Um, and um, the supernova used semiconductor RAM. So the Intel RAM came out in 1970, supernova 1971. So supernova was using the Intel RAM. Uh, and, and, and the supernova also uh, did some things that had a lot of in influence as well. It, it, it came in a box, a rectangular box. Um, and there were circuit boards in there and, uh, and specific uh, or, or, and, and your CPU and memory would be kind of plugged in uh, as, as, as boards. Um, and, uh, and this is very, very much like what our desktops and things look like today. Um, and uh, the PDP-11, which again came out at the same time, uh, the PDP-11 um, introduced uh, uh, something they called the Unibus which meant that all the, all the components on your system were essentially connected via the same bus. And that wasn't always necessarily true before. And so th this, again, is something that we see now. So, so, so in the Supernova and the PDP-11, we see a number of characteristics that um, have carried forward into um, our, our more modern era. Um, these new mini-computers, PDP-11, the, the Nova, supported high-level languages. Um, and uh, time sharing, so they allowed for multiple users to be running on the system at the same time, and uh, they provided very instruction, very powerful um, instruction sets. Um, so we'd consider these complex instruction set computers because at that time humans were still doing a lot of the assembly language programming. Um, the time sharing capabilities of the minis were huge because this allowed then a company or an organization that owned a mini to offer. Um, services to other users. You could log in uh, maybe over a telephone line uh, and access a computer. Um, and, and, and so this started to create a more personal kind of computing. Um, what, what we really see around this time with the mini computers, the second generation of mini computers, is the stage being set for personal computers. And, and there, there, there are a few kind of stark examples of that. 1968, um, in Seattle, there was a company, uh, C-Cubed, that had a PDP-10. That was a, a mini computer that was kind of meant to be a, a mainframe replacement in a way, and it, it allowed for time sharing and some other features. And they um, employed a local high school student, a bright, curious young man, to come and debug their system in exchange for time on the computer. And student rode his bicycle to uh, C-Cubed and 
worked on this computer, and um, which was a, a PDP-10, and that student is, of course, Bill Gates. Um, so Bill Gates, uh, as a teenager, is working on a PDP-10. Um, in the late 1960s, uh, Steve Wozniak uh, snuck into Stanford Linear Acce Accelerator Laboratory Library in order to read the DEC specifications for uh, the PDP-8, read the PDP-8 manual. Um, Steve Wozniak goes on, of course, uh, as, as Bill Gates did, to have tremendous impact on modern computing. Um, and in 1970, um, not teenagers or students, but employees of Bell Labs, uh, Ken Thompson, Dennis Ritchie, had a PDP-11 that they were working with and that they wanted to create an operating system for, and so they started to create what became Unix. And to do that, they created what became C. Um, so, so the PDP um, line had all these points of contact with people who went on to make remarkable you know, discoveries, progress, changes in our, in our modern computer industry. And, and that's part of why this line, the PDP um, line from DEC, w really is one of these kind of beloved, um, beloved uh, systems. Um, and so, in 1971, Intel, moving forward, invents the microprocessor. And it seems as if they almost did it by accident. Um, Intel was in the business of selling memory chips. Memory chips are great because they're relatively simple and there's a big market for it. You got a, you got a, a cash machine on your hands. But they had a customer, a calculator customer from Japan who wanted them to create a chip for their calculator to carry out some of the calculations. And uh, um, Intel realized um, that, well, you know what? It's almost the same amount of work to create a general purpose computer that we put in an integrated circuit as it is to create a kind of specialized circuit that does, you know, calculator op, uh, functionality. And so they worked out a deal with the Japanese company to, to, to put that chip in the calculators that had the general purpose micro microprocessor and yet retained the rights to that micro microprocessor idea to, for Intel, which was a, a very shrewd and wise decision. Um, and again, remember, Alan Turing here, um, the, 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 that, that you can compute, um, uh, you can compute anything with a general purpose computer, and it doesn't have to be terribly complex to do that. And so implementing sort of specialized, specialized circuitry or specialized functionality in integrated circuits um, which is something Intel actually kind of imagined would be their main business model, they realized that, you know what, this doesn't make sense. Uh, let's just have a single microprocessor, and then our customers can write programs for them. We don't have to build them special purpose uh, uh, functionality in their chips. We give them a general purpose computer on a chip, on an integrated circuit, and then they can do what they want with it. And, and that you know, that decision is, is so influential and so key, um, and certainly is what led to Intel being this kind of billion dollar company, multi billion dollar company, uh, as we see that. That first chip was the uh, Intel 4004, the first microprocessor. It was a four bit processor, so it was, it was pretty small, but it was a start. And so by 1972, we see the um, 8008, which was an 8 bit processor, and then in 1974, April 1974, we see the 8080 which was an 8-bit processor, 8-bit microprocessor, and had an instruction set rather similar to the, some of the PDP instruction sets. And that was sort of the magic moment, if you will. The um, Intel 8080 was priced at $360, which, you know, is that a lot or not? It certainly was a lot of money at the time, but think about what you're getting. You're getting a completely functional computer on a chip um, for the cost of four AND gates on integrated circuits in 1960. So, I don't know, seems like a pretty good deal. Um, and so, 
the, the RAM, suddenly memory and processors were available in integrated circuits. Now, that's what's out there on the hardware side. Many computers are still too expensive for individuals to own and buy. And, and yet the time sharing that was available from like the PDP minis, there were services that were set up offering this kind of time sharing and stuff, um, created this kind of thirst for people to have their own computers. And so this led to a kind of uh, almost underground sort of hobbyist culture that um, where people would get together and they would go out and try and buy uh, buy spare parts, buy spare circuits, defect, defects or rejects, you know, cosmetic rejects or whatever, um, and, and to build their own computer from that. It's kind of a challenge and it was, it was something that you could, you know, aspire to do. Um, and um, the, the, the spare parts, um, there, you know, the integrated circuit marketplace was big enough where you could find surplus integrated circuits at electronic stores and things like that. And in fact, Steve Jobs, that was one of his early uh, uh, sources of employment, selling those kinds of, of spare parts at, at outrageous markups, apparently. But, you know, um, that's how it works. And so by 1974, end of 1974, we have. What, what, what is easy to call and to see in retrospect is a kind of perfect storm. You had a large group of users who had grown accustomed to more personal kinds of computing via mini computers, and you had hardware available now uh, that offered a complete computer, at least at the level of an integrated circuit, for really just hundreds of dollars. And so um, the hobbyist culture growing, and then finally it was bound to happen, but someone steps in and they offer a personal computer. And they offered it as a kit. And this was Altair. This was the Altair. Um, the Altair uh, system uh, from the MITS company in Albuquerque, New Mexico, essentially offered hobbyists a collection of parts and a box that they could put the parts in to build their own computer. And so certainly this was easier than going out to surplus electronic stores and finding parts and trying to get it all together and stuff. You'd, you'd, send, uh, you'd send Altair $400, you'd send MITS $400, and at some point in the future you'd get your Altair computer in a box. You'd get the parts for it and then you'd work on putting it together. Now think about what I said about the price of the 8080. The, the Intel microprocessor, that cost $360. How did the Altair cost $400? Well, Altair was able to negotiate with Intel and they got the 8080 for $75 each. And that's an extraordinary markdown. But think about Fairchild, think about Robert Noyce, think about what they were doing when they were starting off with integrated circuits. Sell it below the market price, create a demand. Well, here we go. Take your $360 microprocessor, offer it to a company that's going to sell personal computer kits for 75 bucks. Make it affordable. Build a demand. Very, very shrewd um, and, as we've seen, highly successful. And so customers, too, the important thing here is that you spend $400 on a kit and you might, as a, as a modern person, feel kind of ripped off. You get a box and there are all these parts in there you have to solder, but you have to realize these people knew that, that one of those parts in there was a $360 part. And they got this whole thing for, you know, uh, $40 more. And so, in a sense, there was some value there. Now, the Altair was hard to assemble. And this is where those hobbyist organizations became important. Um, now, the, the Altair, the characteristics of the Altair are that um, it had about 64K of RAM. So, a little bit of RAM. It had an open bus architecture and it had it allowed for plugins there were expansion slots available and so this created the potential of a kind of third party market where other um, people not Altair not yourself could maybe provide uh, a board for some kind of functionality so like maybe an interface to a keyboard or something um, and so it, 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 it opened the door for a lot of innovation 
and exploration by a lot of these different hobbyists and so forth. Um, one of the more prominent of these clubs was known as the Homebrew Computing Club. And this was in the Bay Area, kind of very active in the mid-1970s. Among the more notable members, Steve Wozniak was a regular attendee uh, and was apparently handing out circuit uh, schematics or schematics of like the Apple One and so forth. Very, a very open, inviting kind of culture um, that really helped spread um, computing uh, and personal computing. Um, now the Altair had some very profound impacts that we see even today. Um, uh, one of the first pieces of software for the Altair was a basic interpreter and uh, two students at Harvard uh, saw the Altair was announced in the January 1975 issue of Popular Electronics and these two Harvard students saw the announcement and they, they thought this is a big deal and they offered to write a basic interpreter, the basic programming language, to write a basic interpreter for the Altair. And the Altair folks said, sure, yeah, let's do it, let's sell it. And they wrote it and began to sell it. And um, those two students were Bill Gates and Paul Allen. And so this is the start of Microsoft, starting at the Altair, with the Altair. Um, so, you know, big, big impacts. Um, the um, um, the Homebrew Computing Club uh, experience um, and, and Steve Wozniak being active in that, um, this is about the time he didn't meet Steve Jobs at the Homebrew Computing Club, but this community, this group of people were certainly important to him. And um, April 1st, 1976, uh, about a year and a half after the Altair is introduced, Apple Computer is formed. And Steve Wozniak goes on to design the Apple I and the Apple II, the Apple II in particular, becoming a hugely successful and influential personal computer, um, which we'll get to. But it, it all finds its origins at this time, this place, and, and these sets of circumstances. So a lot going on. Um, so a wonderfully exciting period um, that appears to have almost totally been missed by DEC, digital electronics. They did not find the Intel 8080 terribly interesting, in part because DEC was involved in hardware manufacture. They had their own chips, their own processors. They wanted to focus on those. They weren't too interested in personal computing. Um, it's important to say, too, at this time, in the mid-1970s and, and going into the 1980s, personal computing meant something really kind of different, maybe, than what we think of now. It meant a single-user system that was not connected to a network. And so it was truly a personal computer. It was your computer, and nobody else had access to it. And you didn't have access to anything else, um, not via a network at least. Um, and so DEC wasn't interested in that space. Um, it was, uh, th instead, they were looking up. They were actually wanting to go more at the IBM mainframe market and not down to the personal market. Um, DEC also decided they were not interested in Unix, despite the fact that it was written for the PDP-11. Um, and because why? Well, they had their own operating system, VMS, that they wanted to promote. And so DEC is an example. Uh, we've, we've seen some examples of bet the company moments that work out fabulously, right? Fairchild, bet the company on integrated circuits win big. Um, IBM, bet the company on the 360 line, win big. DEC made their bet on the VAX, the VAX system, and that was a successor of the PDP line. It was intended to be a successor of the PDP line. It was intended to be kind of a small mainframe that would compete with IBM's um, 370 line, which was the successor of the 360. And, well, um, they did a lot of great work with the VAX. Um, the VAX supported um, virtual memory. It supported time sharing. Uh, as did the 370. It, it supported lots of users. It had a beautiful instruction set architecture um, and, and was, from the point of view of complex instruction set computing, uh, a 
a, a really wonderful instruction set architecture that was a, a pleasure to program at almost. Um, but um, and and it, the VAX was successful. So 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 the VAX was introduced in 1978, and DEC sold a hundred thousand of those in the next ten years, up until almost 1990. But the timing was just so unfortunate, um, and um, and so DEC bet the company on the VAX. Um, their motives were actually similar to IBM's with the 360 because DEC had all of these PDP systems out there that were all a little bit incompatible and they were trying to unify everything and so they wanted to discontinue the PDP lines and, and bring everything under the VAX but they misjudged the degree of affection that users had for the PDP line and so there was a lot of resistance to that so DEC managed to antagonize customers they managed um, to um, and also miss the, the, the desire for, for more personal computing until a little bit after it was probably too late. So by 1990, DEC was in trouble. 1992, Ken Olson, the founder, stepped down as president. I think 1995 or 1998, DEC was essentially, DEC was bought or acquired by Compaq and essentially ceased to exist as, a, as, a, as an organization. So it had a a spectacular run in some ways, but not one that was sustained. It 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 it, it, it identified the mini computer market and stayed with it through the whole life of the mini computer market, which was probably you know 1960 to the mid 1980s. But they didn't change, and this is a good example of when we talk about the risk of not changing. We mentioned that with the 360. Well, here's a good sort of morality play about the risk of not changing. Dick w Deck was unwilling to change, unwilling to open its um, you know, philosophy to a different kind of style of computing and, and a different kind of target um, and paid the ultimate price for a company. Um, so personal computing um, in the mid-1970s was this very personal affair and the machines were very simple. When we think of personal computers now, we might think of graphics and networking and all of this, but remember, we're getting very simple devices here. The Altair, you programmed by flipping switches, right? There was no keyboard, nothing like that. Um, the, um, um, there were limited graphics. The Apple II had a kind of had, had color display, uh, but it wasn't the very beautiful kind of bitmap displays we see now. It was a, a more kind of almost ASCII-like uh, look and feel to it. But at the time, was 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 revolutionary. Um, the 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 way that we see computing now, personal computing now, may to some extent be affected by. Um, or, or is very much, I think, related to what we saw in the Apple Macintosh. So in 1984, Apple introduces the Macintosh. Um, the Macintosh was a personal computer with a graphical user interface, easy to use, trying to be very friendly. And, and really, if we look back on a Macintosh and look at how it looked and felt, very familiar to us. Because it really, in some ways, became the standard of what an interface should look like. And so, IBM and um, Microsoft, Microsoft more so in terms of operating, offering an operating system, uh, with Windows began to move from a command line environment that you found in DOS to trying to have a more graphical interface. And, and that's kind of where things have, have moved. Um, it's important to say that, that while that was a tremendous innovation from Apple, um, it, it finds its origins in a different place a little earlier, and that's Xerox PARC. That was a, a research laboratory uh, that uh, was originally connected to Stanford, I believe, and then sort of spun off into um, affiliation with Xerox. And there were numerous important people um, there who really created a lot of what it is we've come to expect in an interface to a, to a computing system. Uh, and those, those include J.C.R. Licklider and Douglas Engel Engelbart. Doug Eng Engelbart is known um, for many things, but he was the person who invented the mouse back in the 1960s, the computer mouse. And um, 
And Xerox PARC defined a kind of interface that has this windows and icons and mouse, pull down menus, the so called WIMP if you take the first letter of all those words, windows, icons, mouse, pull down menu, you get WIMP. Uh, this kind of WIMP interface. And they, they deployed that in an, a system called Alto that was available in 1973. It wasn't available to the public, but it was. Uh, available to select customers for about $18,000. And it included a mouse and windows and bitmap graphics and so forth. So it was very revolutionary, very visionary, but not really a product. Uh, Xerox Park wasn't in the business of creating products, apparently. Um, we should also remember that Ethernet came to us from Xerox Park in 1973. And again, Xerox didn't really aggressively market that. Um, and so Xerox Park great ideas, um, but they didn't really bring them to market. Um, Apple Macintosh, very much a Steve Jobs project, and in 1979, guess who pays a visit to Xerox Park? Steve Jobs. And they showed him what they'd done, and you know they were open about it, and I don't think there was any anything um, bad in what happened there. It's just Steve Jobs saw a way of computing that made sense to him, and that became his vision for uh, where Apple should go. Now remember, at the Apple II was a runaway bestseller, and it's what propelled Apple from being one of many kind of small, obscure companies into being a, a giant, you know, really, I mean, competing with uh, IBM and so forth. And the Apple II was very much a Steve Wozniak project, and it was an elegantly designed uh, system. Uh, didn't have a, it had a keyboard and terminal, but no graphics really to speak of other than that color that I mentioned, and and and, and it was also a very open architecture. Um, Steve Wozniak was a very much of a of a share and share alike mentality, and um, the Apple II kind of marks the end of that attitude at Apple, and uh, and and soon after that, uh, for a variety of reasons, um, including an airline accident, Steve Wozniak um, kind of backed away from Apple. Uh, he's still very loyal to Apple and says a lot of great things about Apple, but, but certainly Apple, the company now, which does not promote sharing or open architectures, is probably not what he envisioned. So um, take that for what it's, for what it's worth, I guess. Um, so by the summer of 1977, we started to see the commodification, if you will, of personal computers. Um, Radio Shack TRS-80 coming out available at malls and department stores for $400, uh, a, a small personal computer. The Commodore PET, another personal computer. The Apple II, just mentioned, came out summer 1977. Uh, the Apple II um, was, an, a, 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 again, an elegant design. And what do we mean by elegant design? We typically mean using fewer chips, less logic, to achieve more performance. That's elegance. And that's what happened with the Apple II. The Apple II used a lot less chips than the Altair but the performance was a lot better. Um, it, and it was open, it allowed for expansion slots, um, it included a basic, a micro, a basic interpreter in read-only memory from Microsoft, and had a, a, a clock, a, a clock rate of one megahertz, uh, which was typical for the day. Um, and so, all of a sudden, in two to three years, you go from a company in New Mexico sending out Altairs in boxes to be assembled at irregular intervals, you know, they're shipping and they were way behind all the time, um, to being able to walk into a radio shack, you know, somewhere in the middle of, you know, northern Minnesota or wherever, and, and buy a computer uh, to take home to be your own computer. I mean, it's, it's kind of an amazing transformation. But the market was there. Right, and if there's enough of a market, stuff happens, and that market was there. Um, somebody who we spent a lot of time talking about IBM, and suddenly I grew quiet about IBM. Well, here comes IBM, 1981, IBM PC. IBM moves into the PC marketplace, and that shakes things up. Puts tremendous pressure on Apple. Um, and many of these smaller personal computer companies that have been out there get beaten down, basically. Because IBM, um, the name recognition and the prestige of IBM certainly persuaded a lot of people who might not normally think about getting a personal computer to say, you know what, this looks like a reasonable thing to have. Because IBM 
says it's a reasonable thing to have. Um, so the IBM PC was not a revolutionary piece of technology. Um, it used the IBM 8088, which was a, 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 a bit of an improvement uh, over the 8080. It had a 4.7 megahertz clock rate, uh, for example. 16-bit uh, word, 64K RAM, not a, not a barn burner uh, for 1981. But it represented a total change in philosophy for IBM as a company in terms of a product they offered. There were no IBM chips or components within it. They bought everything out on the marketplace like everybody else. It was open. Um, you, could, you could add to it. There were expansion slots. Um, the architecture itself was open, which promoted this huge clone market. Uh, that you know, we kind of see the effects of that today. Companies like Dell, this is where they come from, is 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 looking at the IBM architecture and saying, okay, we can put one of these together for a little bit less cost and sell a little bit cheaper, and hope that people who value price over sort of brand prestige will prefer us. And that worked out pretty well. Um, so, um, in 10 years, from 81 to 91, 50 million IBM PCs or their clones were sold. So sweeping sort of um, um, changes there. And among the beneficiaries, well, IBM certainly benefited from that, but even more so, Intel and Microsoft. Um, IBM relying on Intel microprocessors um, and Microsoft software, um, you know, Intel and Microsoft sold lots of hardware and software because of the IBM PC and the clones. Um, and so all of a sudden now we get to the 1980s and we have a real different landscape. Um, we still have mainframes. We have mini computers still. They're still out there. And um, remember the VAX is going great guns, but the VAX is kind of, you know, that's a kind of high performance system. Uh, and then we have the personal computers at the low end. And so there's still a space, right? between that low-end personal computer with no networking and 640K RAM and maybe running MS-DOS as the operating system or some Apple, you know, it's an Apple machine with Apple operating system, Macintosh and so forth. Um, there's, a, there's a gap there between that kind of system and the mini computers represented by, let's say, a, a VAX, you know, costing more than $100,000 or certainly an IBM uh, mainframe like System 370, successor to the 360. And so that's where workstations came into play. And that's a term we still hear now, but workstations should be understood as meaning something very specific. A workstation in the 1980s meant a computer that is networked, that's running Unix, and has hardware, has a microprocessor, RAM, somewhat similar to a personal computer, maybe a little bit better or more, if you will. But really, the networking and the use of Unix were the key characteristics there. Um, the company that's really associated with workstations is Sun Microsystems. Um, Sun Microsystems, uh, not so long ago, was acquired by Oracle, um, but uh, Sun Microsystems was founded in 1982 and really tried to fill that workstation, workstation space. And um, they did that by offering uh, workstations that had Unix, uh, that used Motorola microprocessors, uh, and um, Ethernet was supported. Um, and uh, they had an open architecture. And so it was trying to promote, uh, similar to the strategy of IBM with a PC, they were trying to promote this architecture so that will there be clones and so forth? Yeah, sure, let them let them come. We'll still have our customers, even if there are other people that kind of mimic our design. So this, this was known as a kind of JAWS philosophy, as in just another workstation. Um, and so... Um, so the workstation marketplace did well in the in the 19, uh, you know, the, there was there was a demand there. I mean, among maybe high performance uh, computing people um, who wanted to have, were, were using an IBM PC with MS DOS, you know, wasn't satisfying their needs at all. But a a, a, a Sun workstation, um, they introduced the line of. Uh, Spark processors in the later 1980s, uh, powerful uh, for the day processor. That could satisfy maybe these high performance, scientific, research oriented users uh, who, who 
who the personal computer just wasn't right for. The personal computer really was more of a maybe a home or a very small business tool, but not really a scientific or research-oriented tool like a workstation was meant to be. Um, and so you might think, well, okay, we're at the end of the story, and the cake we've built over the last 50 years, it we have you know that supercomputing cream at the top, we have the mainframe crust, uh, or the mainframe middle, uh, we have a mini computer sort of below that, we have, and then we have personal, com um, we have workstations after that, we have personal computers at the bottom, everybody has something they want here, everybody's happy, story's over. Well, no, no it's not. Um, so, uh, in the end, what we'll see is that the microprocessor that powered the computer uh, the personal computer, ends up eating the rest of the cake, basically. And so the rest of the cake is gone uh, as we stand here today. Not, not precisely, but, but that's a lot of it. So, so what happened? Holy smokes. Um, well, first, remember we've been talking about complex instruction set computers. In the late 1970s, John Cock, a researcher at IBM, uh, theorized that um, smaller instruction sets that did more memory accesses might actually outperform these complex instruction sets that were dominating the mainframe design, the mini computer design, and even the workstation design, and the supercomputing design. These are all kind of complex instruction set architectures. And so he, he, he theorized that, and, and the premises were two. First, um, complex instruction set architectures were designed for humans to program them. And at the time they originated, that made sense. But in the intervening years, compiler uh, advances had gotten to the point where assembly language code is written by a compiler, um, which you know might take a C program as input and produce assembly language as output, um, was just better and more efficient than what a human could write. And so there was less of an incentive to provide a, a language for humans to write in since they'd be better off writing their programs in C or some other language and compiling them and getting assembly language code to run because that assembly language code is going to run better uh, than if they tried to write it themselves. And it'll be faster too. That wasn't always true. Uh, High-level languages and compilers were not always that way. But by the 1980s, they certainly were. Um, in addition, remember, um, Magnetic core. Complex instruction sets really came about originally during the era of magnetic core. And magnetic core was slow, and so memory reads and writes were very expensive. With silicon memory, memory was still slower than processors, but it was faster than uh, magnetic core. And so you could read and write from memory more often without incurring such a performance penalty. And so changes in the underlying technology sort of sort of suggested that risk should outperform CISC. And so IBM didn't pursue this real aggressively at first, in part because they were so heavily invested in CISC. Um, so David Patterson actually in, in 1980 at University of California Berkeley started the RISC project. He coined the term in fact and then followed quickly by John Hennessy at Stanford in 1981 who uh, started a, a, another RISC related project that led to the creation of the MIPS uh, company, which was a risk processor company. And um, by 1987, Sun had adapted, adopted RISC and introduced their Spark Station, which was a RISC-based architecture. Early 1990, Apple and IBM uh, and Motorola created the PowerPC, which was a RISC-based processor. Um, and so you would think, well, okay, Everybody's kind of saved themselves, right? They've 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 converted, so the mini computers are going to be risk now, and the mainframes are going to get there, and the workstations are. So what what happened? Well, Intel and the microprocessor world incorporated risk ideas too, and they also did that while retaining backward compatibility with their earlier processors. So Intel architectures of today can be a little messy, but part of the reason is they've retained everything so that you can run code um, that was written long ago um, for an Intel 
um, processor of 10, 20 years ago, it'll still run. And, and so um, they adapted to risk as well and experienced those performance gains. And also remember our friend Gordon Moore and Moore's Law. Moore's Law continued to hold true. And so the chips that the microprocessors were being built on, twice as many transistors every 18 months, you could make better, faster designs with more and more transistors. You have more material to work with. And so what began to happen is that the microprocessors and the personal computers began to put pressure on the workstations. And um, what we see um, by 1990, um, advances in networking had started to put pressure on Grosch's law too, so that now we could network together smaller systems and get as much of a performance gain as we get from a bigger system. Um, and so um, we started to see this idea of cluster computers. 1993, 1994, the Beowulf project started, and that showed actually that a network of personal computers or workstations could outperform a mini computer or a mainframe even. And so Grosch's law began to fail. Um, and then in 1991, maybe the final nail in the coffin, if you will, of the workstations with the pressure coming up from the, um, from the personal computers was the um, start of the Linux project. Linus Torvalds begins releasing Linux in a free, open way. And Linux is a Unix re-implementation and it can be installed on personal computers, workstations, what have you. And so you didn't, you no longer needed a, ven a vendor, you know, to give you Unix. You didn't need Sun Microsystems anymore. You could just go get it. And so people who maybe wanted a workstation could now, because of advances in networking and operating systems of Linux, their personal computer becomes a workstation. And the workstation market just dries up. Uh, by about 2000 or so, Sun is clearly on the way out. Um, and by that time, the mini computer market had been swallowed up by the workstation market. People who wanted an interactive way to compute, um, who may have been using a mini computer in 1965, 1970, uh, you know, 1975, uh, by 1980, they were using a workstation, or 82, 83, 84, 85. And so the workstation market had already gobbled up the mini computer market, and guess what? Now the personal computer market starts to gobble up the workstation market. And so that kept continuing. The, the microprocessors kept improving, and we kept seeing these gains from networking, um, networking uh, the microprocessor-based systems together into clusters. And this became an alternative to a mainframe. Um, and uh, in fact, today, if you look at the top 500 list, top500.org, these are, these are high performance scientific computing systems. So they're not representative of, of sort of general use cases and stuff. But the vast majority, probably four fifths, eight, you know, um, I was going to say eight tenths, but that's four fifths, nine tenths of um, the um, top 500 systems in terms of their performance in the world um, are these clusters. And they're clusters of ordinary microprocessors. Um, the, the number one ranked system on that list is a, is a big cluster from China uh, that has um, um, hundreds of thousands of processors. Um, and so this is the way that high performance computing has gone. If we look at what we find in a Google data center, Facebook data center, we find networks of cheap microprocessors. And so somehow, somehow, uh, this, this thing that came out of Intel in 1971, when there was all this other market out there, um, ends up consuming it all to some extent. Now, there are still mainframe systems out there um, there are still workstations, but these, these have kind of specialized markets. The vast majority of computing is now done on a relatively consistent set of uh, microprocessors. Um, and so we might think here that, um, well, okay, so problem solved, story's over. Not quite. 
Um, so all of this revolution with microprocessors was taking place, and everyone thought in, let's say, 2000, you know what, microprocessors are just going to get faster and faster. This is great. You know, we're gonna we're gonna be able to do just just sit back and let the hardware make everything better, and this is gonna be great. Well, that was true for a little while, but then in 2004, uh, we hit what's known as the power wall, and the power wall is the observation that linear increases in the clock rate of processors um, result in a cubic increase in power consumption. And that's been true, but it wasn't a, a, a crisis until 2004. And clock rates had risen up to about 3 gigahertz by that time. And if they were going to double again in 18 months, well, that takes you to 6 megahertz, you know, and then, you know, so on. Um, problem was, once you got past about 2.5 megahertz, you were running at more than 100 watts and your computer would burst into flames. And that actually happened. Laptops were bursting into flames. And so this is um, a, um, uh, you know, that's not acceptable, right? And so Intel put their um, mind to the task and came up with the idea of a multi-core architecture. And so as of about 2004, Intel stopped trying to increase clock rates and started increasing the number of cores or processing units on their uh, micro um, computers on the chips. And so now, as we get new computers as time passes, we get more and more cores. And the challenge or the question really is, what do we do with these? How do we optimize uh, performance of our systems based on not increasing clock rates, which had been what we had been relying on for, you know, from, you know, 1970 until 2004, but instead on um, increasing number of cores. And, and that's an open question. Uh, that, that's a challenge, and, and good creative solutions to that, uh, I think, will, um, you know, certainly be very exciting. Um, and so that's where we end up. That's, that's where the story is today. Uh, I think what we have learned, hopefully, is that as we look at uh, the development of computing, at various times, things seem like they should be set, like this is it, this is a great solution. But then something happens that just totally twists things around and, and makes it really exciting, actually, uh, but also forces us to question our assumptions about what computing is and how we should be doing it. And, and certainly, what we can see here is that there's no point in history thus far where you can just sit back and say, okay, I'm okay with where it is now. We're not, we don't need to change anything. That's not true. I don't think it ever will be true. So um, thank you if you have actually watched all of this and made it to this point. I, I thank you. I, I admire you. Um, and uh, I, certainly any questions, comments, etc. are always welcome. And uh, thank you very much.